Today's topic is a new standard in IP and my guest today is Wolfgang Beres of Woza und Kollegen. He's partner at the firm and he talks with me about the new standard in IP. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Maybe you can um, tell our listeners and our viewers uh, where you are coming from and what your background is, um, what you are doing at Woza and Kollegen. Yeah, I sure love to. Um, my background is actually uh, way off the uh, IP landscape. Uh, I have a master in management and uh, computer science, and I worked for more than 25 years with uh, Siemens AG. Uh, last 10 years in the automotive business mainly, and uh, my office was out of Detroit. And, and um, in 2009, 2009, I met with uh, Professor Woods uh, and uh, we developed ideas about a new way uh, to handle IP management. management. For, For me, me as a uh, uh, non-IP non person, person, I was always asking for the, 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 the business side of IP. So, so for me, as a starting point always was customer benefits and business rather than uh, a legal, legal in, uh, interpretation of uh, IP issues. And therefore, over time, I guess we came up with a couple of pretty good ideas. And uh, yeah, today I'm a consultant of Wurzer and colleagues. And in addition, I'm a spokesperson for a group uh, we call a KEMIP, a quality initiative for the management of IP, which is a non-profit association. And uh, we're going to help, uh, especially uh, around the implementation of the new standard we're going to talk about. Yes, let's talk about this new standard. Um, what what is this standard exactly? What is the the name? Uh, the first thing is maybe the name. What is it? <laughs> what what is the specification yeah. basically? And then what it's all about? Like uh, why do we need a standard? What what is the standard? Maybe you can just briefly yeah. introduce the standard before we go more into depth. Sure, sure, I will. Uh, yeah, what is it all about and why do we need another standard? Uh, actually, uh, there is a ISO standard uh, on its way. Um, the standard um, we are talking about is a DEAN standard right now. Uh, a DEAN standard meaning a German standard on IP management and it's called DEAN 7070006. -007. We couldn't get 007, would have been probably smarter. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, this standard um, is uh, uh, about IP management sy system requirements. And uh, especially requirements is quite important uh, in that context because the standard is an implementation standard of the Dean ISO 9001. Most of you will be uh, um, um, quite uh, aware of uh, because most of the companies obviously have this standard uh, certified or are certified by this standard. And um, uh, the 7706 from the very beginning uh, was thought to, uh, to be a, uh, a very similar requirement standard, which means it's based on the very same so-called high-level structure. And uh, a high-level structure is, is just the agenda of the standard and of all the ISO 9000 standards. We'll talk about later about the exact structure and what are the common principles among all these 9000 uh, standards. But before we jump into that, uh, maybe first we'll talk about what what are actually what have been the challenges in IP management so far, and um, so what what are the challenges where, where where did the idea for the standard come from? Why did we? Why did you develop this standard? Uh, what went wrong so far? Let's talk about the yeah. general background. Like, why? What went? Yeah. Why? Why did we need it? A new standard. And what are the? What have been the the challenges in IP that this standard is addressing? I guess, I guess uh, one of the the, the 
ideas uh, we had in the very beginning, we started working on that standard probably four or five years ago. And uh, there was an initiative we had before where we uh, talked to a lot of companies and uh, uh, talked about the, the status of IP departments. And uh, we found out that IP, um, and for me that was quite interesting as I'm not the IP guy, uh, it, it was interesting that IP was kind of an island within uh, the the companies and uh, somehow um, not only in Ireland because of the uh, topics they were dealing with which were obviously legal talk topics not really business topics but also uh, very often because of the people who were working there uh, we met a lot of people in IP departments who were former uh, R&D people and one day it was decided, okay, we need somebody uh, to take care of IP and why don't we move you to the IP department and um, until you retire. Uh, sounds strange, but it's, it's really true. Uh, it was a different understanding. The traditional IP work in, I would say, mid-sized companies. I'm not talking about the big ones. But in mid-sized companies, you have one, two, three people working on IP. And uh, what they do is more or less administrative work and there is no really best practice available for them. And uh, that's what happened uh, during our consulting work. We got a lot of questions about, can you, uh, uh, can you help us with the best practice uh, example uh, to build a uh, efficient IP department? And that's where it all started. And uh, over time, we found out, or the idea developed in a, in a direction that IP management in itself is not another name for the work of the IP department. But IP management is actually a challenge for the whole company. And, uh, and therefore, this standard, uh, which describes requirements for IP management, describes requirement for a company rather than uh, the IP department. That's actually something which distinguishes uh, this standard from the ISO um, 56005, which is called uh, IP management uh, in, in the, uh, if I'm we recall it correctly, IP management in the innovation management guideline. Uh, so uh, it's a guideline versus a requirement. And uh, uh, this guideline uh, shows certain best practices, methods, tools you can implement in an IP department. So here, IP management is more or less understood as an organization uh, where we define in our standard IP management as a process and a management system. So you are also likely talk about processes and concepts that have not been part of many IP departments before. You are introducing also new ideas into existing companies that so far, uh, existing departments that so far mostly just basically administered IP rights and not really had any creative take on how to work yeah. with IP, let's say. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say we, we create yet now new processes or we have brand new ideas in, in terms of what's the IP management of the future in, in we have distinguished between the traditional IP management and a more active contemporary IP management where we think the the active IP management is not an IP management waiting for an invention I guess yes. that's uh, exactly what the picture has been. Uh, there is an apartment waiting for an invention. And if R&D or anybody else in the company is not inventing anything, they will just wait. And an active IP management will discuss um, what the instrument 
IP is capable of, uh, how you uh, can use these pro prohibitive rights, so to speak, and and uh, how you can act in the market or develop a market and protect your market using this instrument. So uh, an active IP department will be involved in uh, business strategies and and that's what it's all about we will we are talking about a business centric approach versus a uh, i would say invention centric approach so you already mentioned uh, now the challenges of the past and uh, basically um, uh, summarized what are the advantages of the new standard so but maybe we go into a little bit more detail what the advantage of this new standard is. What, why do uh, companies like mid-sized companies need this standard? Can't they just use you as a consultant <laughs> to get better in IP <laughs> management? <laughs> of course they can, but um, why, uh, what is, why, how is the standard helping them to improve their IP management? Uh, okay. Um, first of all, and, and, and it's always the same question: Is the standard uh, not just additional, uh, an additional workload for a department, or, or is it helping to develop uh, a best practice or a more efficient system within the company? Um, now, this standard has because it is an implementation, uh, implementation standard of uh, the uh, Dean 9001. Um, it uses not only existing terminology or an existing structure, uh, it is actually defined as a management system and therefore easily implements with other uh, management systems in the company. So uh, we take the IP department off the aisle and put it right in the middle of the company, back again where it belongs. And uh, so we have interacting elements of the organization like policies. Uh, and we have IP policies and we have other policies and we have business objectives and, and we have obviously business processes. And so we have IP processes to directly connect with these business processes. And all this is based on a yeah, structure which is well known to companies for many, many years and uh, a core process which is uh, called uh, the PDCA cycle. We'll talk about that a little later, I promise. <laughs> but um, maybe first um, you're saying basically that um, companies who already implemented ISO 9001 standards and they are very familiar with uh, the concept and they can, uh, it will be not so difficult for them to grasp the core concepts of this new standard and uh, implement this new standard. Did I hear you right? Absolutely, absolutely. That's the, the idea uh, behind this. Um, we didn't want to create something completely different or new, and it doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense at all to come up with a, uh, a different principle of, or a different idea of standards, because if you want to achieve total quality uh, management, or what, if you'd like to implement a total, total quality management system, you have to go with the ISO 9000 group of standards. Mm. No question. Okay. Um, before we um, recorded this interview, um, we talked about this uh, new standard a little bit, and you said there are basically uh, there are many um, important aspects of this new standard, but uh, two are coming to mind uh, especially, and one is risk management, and the other one is to find and exploit opportunities within the IP landscape uh, or of an IP portfolio. Let's talk about risk management first. What, what, what is your message here? Uh, what, what do the listeners and viewers need to know about the new standard in connection with risk management? Yeah, yeah. the, the uh, uh, risk, risk management, management, you know, you know it's like, like always. always. Um, if, if 
you need a certain pressure um, to change your organization. Uh, yeah, it's stupid, but uh, a pressure coming from a certain risk is always uh, or always helps you uh, to change a little faster than if it's just uh, an opportunity you have. And uh, same here. Um, over the last couple of years, uh, with the digital uh, transition uh, or transformation, a lot of companies uh, have implemented uh, implemented it not into their own organization, but into their um, business, into their business models. So everybody likes to be digital nowadays, and. Um, with uh, the digital, digitalization uh, of the business, suddenly in IP uh, risk or the, the risk scenario has changed completely. Uh, if we just imagine that we would create uh, an application for uh, a company um, and the application would uh, somehow interact with a 5G campus network, then the specialists here uh, would know instantly that uh, 5G means probably around 25,000 patents uh, or a patent portfolio, even though um, uh, it might be uh, organized by your telecom provider or whatever. But still, there is there is a, a definite uh, risk um, that at the end of the day you will uh, infringe certain patents if you're um, not looking into or if you're not uh, implementing a process to make sure you have done everything and you have step by step uh, discovered potential risk areas. Um, and that's what risk management is all about. And um, the, the standard is asking to implement risk management rather than uh, doing FTOs uh, across the planet. And that was uh, my question. Is, so yeah. the difference between risk management and FTO. So <laughs> yeah, the FTO approach is, and you know, I have to be careful now as I'm talking to a patent attorney and you know <laughs> better what this is all about. But I would say an FTO approach usually tries to do uh, to go for the more or less 100% solution. You might say, yeah, that's that has never been possible, and and it was always only ninety percent, or you know, or tell me what you want to pay, and I do the FTO I can do for that money, um, and all this is not really business like. It's not really sufficient if you if you think about managing risk on a uh, company level, and we always have to manage risk as a company. And the CEO is, or, or CFO, he's familiar, or she is familiar with managing these kind of risks. But the IP risk was, ne yeah, I, I would say, it was never really implemented in the risk management model of a company. And that's what now is part of this IP management system, um, that it is a requirement that IP management risks are uh, described in a way that a company is able to handle them. And at the end of the day, it has to be a management decision. Okay, if we know there is a risk, okay, what are we going to do? Are we going to go for that business or are we going to stop the business? It's always a management decision. Right. Okay. Then there was the second uh, aspect about how to find and identify opportunities and how to yeah. exploit these opportunities. How does the DIN norm help with that? Yeah, that's uh, a part I like much better than the risk management <laughs> part <laughs> uh, because opportunity is always a, a, a beautiful new, uh, I would say, construct because uh, for the first time, we're coming up and that's really new because it's even um, um, a new created word, if, yeah, I'd like to say so, because we come up with the IP design principle. And IP design refers to 
the design of an object, especially a digital object, like an app or use case or a digital business model. And uh, uh, these objects are related to typically to business goals. Um, I, I'd like to grow my market share. So I, I'm looking at a digital business object and with IP design, I make sure that these digital objects are built in a way that they are patentable and that you take the necessary steps, going back to the risk management, so you do not infringe the right of third parties. But you have to watch out. I'm not talking about taking an invention and making a patent out of it. I'm talking about designing IP around a digital object. So we change the digital object if necessary to make it patentable. We don't change the invention. Sounds maybe a bit complicated, but um, if uh, it is part of the idea of the standard that a process like this IP creation process needs to needs to be implemented in a different way within the innovation management of a company or uh, the idea management of a company. Does it also encompass uh, things like licensing opportunities? Let's say it in a in a positive term or in a negative term, saying extorting licenses from others, like like uh, like the just uh, mentioning the keyword patent troll or so. Uh, of course, this is a really negative uh, word, but. Um, Of course, when you have patents, uh, you and and you are yourself develop this this uh, this technology, and you're using the technology, and someone else is using the technology. Of course, there is uh, the clear right to defend your your uh, your turf, and but there are also companies that are just amassing uh, patents and uh, trying to find licensing opportunities and um, suing other companies for patent infringement um, just for as a business model basically um, and there, there's a this is these are two different uh, things and um, there is no black and white uh, but how does this denorm play into this field <laughs> Uh, it, it definitely does. I just had a, um, a conversation with uh, uh, an automotive supplier, well-known Continental, and um, uh, the, the, the problem uh, they were telling me about is that uh, they were saying that the world of, of patents or the world of uh, Uh, relationship between suppliers and and uh, customers uh, uh, regarding patents has changed dramatically because the uh, you're not infringing anymore uh, if uh, you're dealing with your d direct supplier you might infringe even patents off somebody in the value chain way back uh, talking about uh, typical cases like Broadcom versus Volkswagen and so on. And yes. so, um, and, and the question was, is it helpful to have a standard? Uh, because with a standard, you can't avoid infringement, which has happened already. Um, and um, I have to say, just consider maybe one point. If you have a contract with your supplier and the contract uh, gives you Uh, the freedom of third-party rights, which is usually written into a contract, a supplier contract. It says freedom of third-party rights. If it would say freedom of third-party rights based on Dean 7706, you have the opportunity at least to go back, talk to your supplier and say, okay, I'd like to do a third party audit on what you have uh, done in your on your risk management side. So suddenly with mm -hmm. the uh, uh, Dean, you, you have something in your hands you can work with. It's, it's not that uh, infringements uh, are going to disappear and, and patent trolls are not disappearing anyhow, but uh, it's, it's one little additional cornerstone to build this kind of new um, IP management building. Yes. Okay. 
Um, we, I promised you that we also talk about the PDCA model <laughs> and let's talk about this um, uh, in our last uh, section of our interview. Um, PDCA stands for Plan, Do, Cre um, Check and Check. Act. Um, Act. And all the 9001 standards are based on this basic principle. Um, you gave me a, a picture that I can uh, show here in a second. Yep illustrating the the model uh, maybe you can talk about how the d norm is implementing this general principle i'm showing the picture now okay uh, it's uh, the pdca cycle or so-called the deming cycle um, is is core to these uh, type of standards because it's actually the basis for uh, total quality management um, and why? Pretty easy, because it requires from everybody who is implementing the standard to have a plan, to do what the plan says, to check if it has been done what the plan said, and uh, if there has been any, any changes uh, uh, and, and, and if improvement is necessary to act and change things to go into the next planning phase. This is pretty obvious. It, it, um, it was brought up in the 9000 uh, standards when they moved from the old way to the new way and the new way of the standard was a process oriented standard because this here is a process. Mm. And uh, as you can see on this picture, what we did, we uh, took the, the, the processes we had discussed or yeah, derived out of the, out of the IP management, typical IP management uh, um, environment and implemented these processes into the PDCA cycle. And okay, there's a lot of more details to it, but in principle, you can say uh, there is an operational part and there you have everything from the IP administration in, in the IP department. The IP administration obviously is still very much in the IP department. You have IP generation, uh, we just talked about, a creation generation, where we have all the opportunities. Uh, you have IP enforcement, uh, your legal arm here, and IP defense. And you have, and you talked about it uh, already, uh, uh, the topic of IP uh, transactions. So if you buy or sell licenses uh, here in IP, that's part of the IP transaction process. So all this is the operation, so to speak, but, and and you might have both part of the operation in inside a an organization, like an IP department. But outside of the IP department, for sure is the IP objective and IP uh, policy area because that's business related and uh, as well is the IP strategy uh, which here in the center uh, part of this model uh, belongs to the leadership part of the standard and leadership is not just the IP department leadership it's actually the business leadership we're talking about here so uh, what we have achieved with building a process-driven standard uh, based on PDCA, um, I guess we moved the IP department back where it belongs uh, to a uh, level, um, or to a business-oriented um, area in the company, um, uh, not only area, um, Yeah, it's not and it's not a <laughs> not an island anymore where people are banned after they have been working in yeah. development and research but it's more now like a core the core in the core of the company um it's and a, it it has to be part of the uh, cto ceo cfo agenda mm -hmm. and uh, i guess uh, everybody who start imp implementing that now uh, understood it right away and uh, and it is quite helpful that we have people 
uh, in the companies who deal with quality management. And these quality management people know exactly that uh, as all the other quality topics are management related, now IP is management related as well. So um, this was a very thorough and fun interview. Thank you very much for coming here <laughs> and uh, spending your time with me and explaining uh, to me and the listeners and viewers uh, about this new norm in uh, IP management. If people still have questions about this, I mean, we couldn't, we could only touch the surface basically and the tip of the oh. iceberg. There is so much more about this uh, initiative. Um, where can people go to find out more about this uh, norm and about your work uh, on standardizing the IP management process? Yeah, as I mentioned already, uh, we have a, a little group uh, where we'd like to uh, offer support uh, for companies, uh, usually small, medium-sized companies, but whoever is interested in, in working with the new standard. And uh, this group is called Kima Quality Initiative for the Management of IP, and it's www.kimip.de. Kimip is spelled Q I M I P. All right. <laughs> okay. I'm linking yeah. this also in the show notes and uh, perfect. So Thank people you. can just click on the link and find more about you. Yeah. Thank you very much for being on the show. And thank you for having me. <laughs> All right.